This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The storming of the Legislative Council building in Hong Kong condemned as a severe violation of the rule of law. Ethiopia's Prime Minister vows to crush attempts to undermine the country's sovereignty. And Uganda and Sierra Leone signed a number of cooperation agreements to boost bilateral ties. Hello and a very warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Mtongana in Nairobi. Also coming up this hour. In business, a sigh of relief in Zimbabwe as the central bank extends forex withdrawal limits to $1,000 a day. And Senegal book a place in the knockout round of the Africa Cup of Nations after defeating Kenya. Well, we start today's program in China where the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office of China State Council has expressed firm support for the Special Administrative, Administrative Region's government after demonstrators stormed the Legislative Council building yesterday. A spokesperson said storming the complex and destroying facilities inside the building constitutes a severe violation of the rule of law. The spokesperson added it is an open challenge to the principle of one country, two systems. The office says it strongly condemns such actions and supports the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region's government to investigate the criminal responsibility of violent offenders in accordance with the law. The liaison office of the Central People's Government in Hong Kong also denounced the violence, saying it wants to work to safeguard the city's stability and prosperity. And the Chinese Foreign Ministry's Commissioner's Office in Hong Kong says the demonstrator's behavior has seriously undermined the rule of law, social order and the fundamental interests of Hong Kong. It accused the US, the UK and the European Union of ignoring the violence and defending the criminal activities of the protesters. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has called on outside powers to stop interfering in China's domestic affairs. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China. Hong Kong's affairs are the internal affairs of China. We are firmly opposed to foreign interference in our internal affairs. China warns certain countries not to interfere in Hong Kong's affairs, support violent offenders, send any misleading signals or conduct any wrong behaviors. Meanwhile, the Hong Kong government's chief executive, Carrie Lam, has praised an estimated 190,000 people who protested peacefully on Monday, but has also condemned the violence carried out by a smaller group at the region's legislative council. Earlier, we spoke to our reporter, Zhu Dan, for more details. The order of the city was disrupted as many of the roads were still closed. The services of the subway were disrupted. Police have put up barricades around the electrical building where a group of protesters storm into the complex, with council officials issuing a red alert for the first time ever. Protesters storm through the Legislative Council after forcing their way into the complex. All this time, police were really restrained. Meanwhile, 42 legislators issued a joint statement saying the protesters had disrupted, disturbed public order and challenged Hong Kong's rule of law. Earlier this morning in a press conference at police headquarters, Kara Lam said the violence and vandalism by protesters who storm into the Legislative Council building really saddens and shocks a lot of people here. We have seen two entirely different public scenes. One is a um, regular march on the 1st of July. Regardless of the number of participants in the march, the march was peaceful and generally orderly. And this uh, fully reflects the inclusiveness of Hong Kong society and the core values we attach to peace and order. The second scene that we have seen, which really saddens a lot of people and shocks a lot of people, is the extreme use of violence and vandalism by protesters who stormed into the Legislative Council building um, over a period of time. So uh, this is something that uh, we should seriously condemn. 
because nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, Police Commissioner Stephen Law explained why the police staged a retreat following a eight hours defending of the electrical building in the face of violent tactics by the protesters. During the charging, they throw in some uh, white smoke. That, uh, as you know, in the afternoon, there were already a, a toxic uh, powder um, attack on my officer in the afternoon. So without knowing whether this is another toxic uh, powder attack, we have no other choice but to temporarily retreat from LegCo. 13 police officers were taken to hospital on Monday after some uh, protesters splashed an unknown liquid onto them during chaotic scenes. Clearly, this is already not, uh, this is a well-equipped and well-organized riot. Well, let's turn to news now from Ethiopia, where Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has vowed to crush attempts to undermine the country's sovereignty. Ahmed was addressing parliament for the first time after a failed coup attempt in the Amhara region last month. Dozens of people, including five senior officials, were killed. The Ethiopian Prime Minister says his government is now taking measures to protect the country. And this is what he had to say about the identities of those linked to the failed coup in Amhara region. The people who are apprehended in Benishagul region are assassins. Same in Oromia. Assassins have been captured. By the way, a very considerable number of soldiers who participated in this coup attempt are soldiers who previously came to this palace fully armed those of which the defense forces had detained, evaluated, and let go. They were young, and they believed that they could be remorseful. They used them, but they tried to tell us that this was not a coup attempt. The coup attempt was led by Brigadier General Asamneo Sige Asamneo. Asamneo had claimed that the central government was doing little for the Amhara people, Ethiopia's second largest ethnic group. But ABA sees the events of the 22nd of June as animosity against national authorities in Ethiopia. A rational mind cannot think about orchestrating a coup at a federal level unless it was meant to commit atrocities. But once you've become irrational, you'll not succeed, but you don't choose where to start. Never. Otherwise, thinking about orchestrating a coup at a federal level in the present-day Ethiopia is insanity. Impossible. You may create a tragedy whereby hundreds of thousands are slaughtered in a single day, but you cannot form a government. Meanwhile, Ethiopia's economy is set to expand despite the unrest rocking the country. Looking at the general demand and supply activities of our economy, evidence indicates that the economy is recuperating. Economic indicators show that our economy is growing at a rate of 9.2% during this budget year. Since taking office in April 2018, ABA has rolled out a series of reforms to help revamp the country's economy as well as forge unity within the nation and with neighboring countries. Chom Hono, CGTN. And to North Africa now, where the self-styled Libyan National Army, led by Khalifa Haftar, is intensifying airstrikes on targets in and around Tripoli. A spokesman for the army is warning Tripoli residents against going into areas occupied by or linked to the internationally recognized government of national accord. LNA spokesperson Al Nizmari said the army aims to destroy the combat capability of the GNA, who they refer as terrorist groups, through multiple and consecutive airstrikes day and night. Last night, there were very intensive air operations. The LNA Air Force started by destroying an automated aircraft, a Turkish drone, which was about to take off from a military base at the Matiga Air Base and was targeted on the ground by the Libyan Air Eagles forces. Al Mezmari also claimed the LNA destroyed a Turkish drone near the Maitiga airport inside Tripoli.
We are monitoring all the civilian places that have been exploited as military headquarters. Therefore, we hope that the citizens of the area referred to, which is the entire Tripoli area, even inside the city of Tripoli, not just its surroundings, even inside Tripoli. Maitika is the only functional airport in and around the capital and is controlled by the Tripoli government. The group launched an offensive against Tripoli in April, where the UN Allied government is based. The Air Force aims to destroy the combat capability of terrorist groups through multiple and consecutive airstrikes day and night. Therefore, we want the citizens to take care, take caution and pay attention and stay as far as possible from the terrorist GNA gatherings as well as their places of concentration and operation rooms and stay away from everything related to the GNA forces because there will be strong blows. The LNA controls much of eastern and southern Libya. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Uganda and Sierra Leone have signed agreements to cooperate in defense and security and political consultation, including waiving visa fees for diplomatic passport holders. Uh, President Julius Madubio is in Uganda for a three-day state visit at the invitation of President Yoweri Museveni. Isabel Nakia reports from Kampala. Sierra Leone and Uganda are looking into improving trade by opening a possible route by water and train to link the two countries. Both countries have sizable iron ore deposits and want to explore ways to improve their mineral development. A cheap transport way across the belt, the belt of Africa, which links the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic. And then you continue by water to, to West Africa. So this is something that we shall have to discuss more with the Congo, with the Brazzaville, and with West Africa. The two countries have also agreed to build capacity in military training and strengthen peace and security. So we are here to learn and to share the little that we have that you may need. But I know that you have done a great lot to bring peace and tranquility, which is the ecosystem needed for development. And indeed, you have registered development in this country. Presidents Bio and Museveni have urged Sudan's military council to resume dialogue and restore peace. Protesters in Sudan have defied the military rule they are calling for a democratic government. Over 100 deaths have been reported during protests in Khartoum since former President Omar al-Bashir was deposed in April. President Bia will also attend the blockchain conference in Kampala before departing. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN, in Kampala. Now, Cuba and Angola have signed eight new cooperation agreements to expand bilateral ties and forge a strategic partnership. Cuban President Miguel diaz Cain and his Angolan counterpart, João Lorenco, witnessed the signing ceremony in sectors that include health, education, water resources and labor. The two sides have agreed on legal and judicial assistance of personnel in criminal matters and transfer of jailed citizens to their nations of origin. Cuba says it attaches great importance to relations with Angola, pledging to deepen bilateral and multi multilateral cooperation. This act clearly symbolizes the profound relationship of friendship, solidarity and cooperation between our people that we consecrated and eternalized when both poured their blood to defend the noblest ideals of human beings, freedom and the right to choose their own destiny. Today there are common challenges, defending the right to development, welfare and social justice, safeguarding international peace and security. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir is in Kenya on a two-day state visit where he met with his host, President Uhuru Kenyatta, in Nairobi. The two leaders held bilateral talks touching on the revitalized peace agreement, security and trade. CGTN's Robert Nagila has more. The Southern Sudanese leader jetted into Kenya early on Monday for a two-day state visit at the invitation of President Uhuru Kenyatta. 
This meeting comes at a time when South Sudan is in the process of implementing the revitalist peace agreement and is trying to rebuild its economy shattered by the civil war. The agreement, signed in September 2018 by President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Riek Masha, brought to an end a brutal civil war that lasted almost five years, claiming an estimated 400,000 lives and displacing more than 4 million people. At a briefing, the two leaders reaffirmed their commitment to see the peace agreement fully implemented. I urge the international community led by the United Nations and the Troika of the United States, United Kingdom and Italy to engage strongly in support of the people of the South Sudan as well as her government. We are delighted to further note that we have received assurances that the government of Kenya will be exerting uh, additional efforts to bolster the smooth implementation of the peace agreement. The two leaders also agreed on a framework to engage on border security challenges between the two countries. On trade, Kenya offered South Sudan land to construct a dry port to ease movement of goods. Nairobi also proposed to hold its trade expo in South Sudan in November in an effort to boost its economy. Kerr is expected to hold meetings with potential investors and business leaders before he leaves for Juba on Tuesday. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. A suspected stowaway believed to have fallen from the landing gear of a Kenya Airways flight in London. And the raging debates over the costly bride price in Uganda. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Right, let's start in Nigeria now, where one more body has been recovered from the area where a boat capsized in Lagos on Sunday night. This brings the total number of bodies recovered so far to eight. Three were rescued alive, but others are still unaccounted for. CGTN's Deji Badmus has the details. The latest body to be recovered from the area of the sea where the ill-fated boat capsized. Rescue officials and local divers are still squaring this whole area where the boat went down, hoping to find more buddies. About 20 persons were on board the boat when it took off from Aja, some one hour away from this community by boat. With the exception of three survivors, no other person has been found alive. Among the survivors is this man. He gives an account of what exactly happened. Before we set out, it took a while before the boat could be started. And on our way, the engine of the boat suddenly stopped. Water then began rushing onto the boat. It then capsized and everybody jumped off. Authorities have begun an investigation into the accident, vowing to take tough actions against anyone found culpable. Preliminary reports gathered. One, they did not abide with the rules and regulation of the Lagos state government. One, in them um, traveling or plying the, our waterways after 7 p.m., there's a rule in place that you can only ply our uh, waterways between 6 a.m. to um, 7 p.m. Secondly, there's these rules that if you want to travel on our waterways, you must use life jackets. All the passengers of the boat did not use uh, did not use 
life jacket, nor there, uh, there is no um, life boy inside the boat. This accident brings to three similar boat accidents in the area in the past three years. In 2016, seven persons lost their lives when a passenger boat capsized in bad weather around the area. Another boat accident on the waters here last July claimed five lives. We are going to conduct sensitization program for the people in that communities. We are going to enforce a lot of things. And again, we've set up a committee to look at everything holistically. So we are going to implement all the recommendations by that committee. While that committee does its work, the search for more bodies continues. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Ikorodu, Lagos. A suspected stowaway who is believed to have fallen from the landing gear of a flight into Heathrow Airport has been found dead in a London garden. The body, believed to be that of a man, was found in Clapham. Police believe the individual fell from a Kenya Airways flight from Nairobi. Authorities in Britain are in touch with Kenyan officials to investigate the identity of the man. Now, reports compiled over the course of about 50 years show that survival rates for stowaways are fairly low. So why do they attempt it? Well, CGTN's Wilkista Nyabwe explores just what happens when people attempt to stow away on aircraft. The man whose body fell from a Kenya Airways jet and landed in a garden in London was reported to have sneaked into the plane's wheel well before the plane set off. A wheel well is a landing gear compartment of an aircraft. While dozens have made similar attempts to travel in it, the chances of survival are low. Between 1947 and June 2015, the U.S. Federal Aviation Authority recorded 113 such attempts on 101 flights either departing from or landing in the United States. Of these 113 people, 86 died. Wilwell stowaways face considerable danger during takeoff, cruise and landing. Immediately after takeoff, the landing gear retracts into the wheel wells, potentially crushing the stowaway. During flight at altitudes above approximately 8,000 feet, hypothermia also becomes a risk. The partial pressure of oxygen in a wheel well is below that required to support brain consciousness. Temperatures also decrease with altitude. If the stowaway does not regain consciousness and mobility by the time the landing gear is lowered during the final approach or has already died, the body may fall from the aircraft. According to the FAA, it is likely that the number of stowaways is higher than records show due to bodies having fallen into the ocean. Questions then abound as to why stowaways take the risks, like immigrants who undertake the risky journey across the Mediterranean to seek a new life elsewhere, many stowaways are leaving desperate situations to seek a new life. It is a last resort, and even if they survive the journey, they risk arrest or deportation. The man in the latest incident is yet to be identified. Wilkisanyabwa, CGTN. Well, let's get you some more perspective on this particular issues, uh, issue of uh, stowaways. We're joined from Johannesburg by Desmond Latham. He is an aviation journalist. And here in studio with me is Mwenda Mbijiwe. He's a former Kenya Air Force officer. Thank you so much uh, for both, to both of you for your time. Let's start with you, uh, Mwenda. Of course, it's rather shocking, the story of how tragically this man has died as a stowaway on the airplane. But just try and help us understand how one might have attempted such, such, a, such a dairy um, you know, move to another country, as it were, and how such a plan might have been executed. Thank you. First of all, it's a very sad and shameful uh, occurrence. I mean, emanating from our country. But again, in Africa, nothing is new. I mean, this is the same immigrant problem we are having in the north of Africa, where people are dying in the Mediterranean Ocean, trying to cross, to cross into Europe. Now, um, what happened here is somewhat, someone truly lied to the security barrier at the airport. And there are many you know, uh, theories as to how that happened. Maybe mm -hmm. this was someone with an airport pass. This was a worker maybe at the airport or working at the cargo area and came to drop, say, luggage or, or say, flowers or other things into the plane. 
surely it must be someone who deceived the security barrier. Mm. Because I'll tell you, I've been to that airport many times. I work in private security sector, and I've never had the access there unless you're protected and guarded by police and other people. Mm. So this is someone who is an insider. This could not have been someone who came from the road and went into the plane. Mm. No, mm. this is someone who had the access. There's still a lot of questions. And of course, what's very clear is that it is a very, very risky endeavor. Let's come to you, Desmond, uh, in Johannesburg. Just considering the risk of, you know, the conditions in an airplane that you're trying to be a stowaway on, and of course, the, the risk associated with security at airports, how prevalent then is this issue of stowaways indeed here in Africa and other parts of the world? Well, we've had cycles, and it's linked, um, as your other uh, guest has said, to the growing pressures a country faces. I mean, South Africa's had two incidents in the last three years where uh, um, uh, two people were, were killed in the wheel bay of an aircraft coming from Nigeria into South Africa, for example. But most are trying to fly or leave from, as your guest said, North Africa um, into, into Europe or America. The big thing here is that many um, uh, landing strips and and airlines operate from fairly isolated parts in cities. So there's, as uh, you were talking about in that uh, report, the FAA is saying that, that they know about over from 1947 to 2015, the 113 cases you mentioned. But we think that's it's a lot more because of course the, the, the wheel bay opens out and people drop out and then it's an isolated area in the countryside somewhere. So it could be a, a bigger issue than we, we even uh, expect. Mm. And Renda, then coming back to you then, it's, it's, uh, you, you've mentioned some of the security issues that are prevalent to this particular instance. In your view, um, just what are some of the major security lapses in this scenario and how should the airport respond? First of all, there is the, the access, the vetting of the people that have access to the airport. It is, it's an international, uh, it's an IATA practice, International Air Transport Agency that all people working in international airports must undergo training and vetting. In this era of terrorism, and Kenya being in, 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 one, of the, in uh, one of the countries in the region that have a lot of terrorism, we must vet who works at the airport. So there is failure, even of the companies. Once it's investigated and this gentleman is known and which company he worked for, that company should be sanctioned. Mm -hmm. Number two, there is the physical you know, uh, check of the, air, of, the, of the airplane. The Kenya Airways, Kenya Airways will be on the spot and they are on the spot. How did this plane leave the ground without proper checks? Let's say this guy did not even get under the plane, you know, in the, in the wheel section. He planted a bomb in the wheel mm. section. Or he went in there and vandalized the electrical wires mm. or the, the, the fuel, the fuel, you know, uh, passage, passages in the plane. What would have happened if this plane had an electrical failure up there? So the, there is the physical check of the plane. They needed to be thorough at it. And finally, the, the coordination between the, the national security agencies, the police, the national intelligence at the airport, and the private security agencies there, mm -hmm. particularly those working for Kenya Airways. Absolutely. Those are critical questions they must be able to answer those mm, questions. Mm, absolutely, and there'll be a lot of attention on that in the days ahead. Yes. Uh, coming back to you, Desmond, uh, of course, in Johannesburg, you know, you've been working as an aviation journalist. When you listen to the risks involved, how often have you come across a case where somebody has been a successful stowaway? And in, in that respect, then, what do managers of airports need to do to discourage people from even attempting such a risky journey? Well, I mean, there are a few things. Uh, the first thing is the walk around of the airplane by the pilots, which they're doing. But the problem with these large airlines on the large uh, planes is that in the wheel bay, there's, a, there's a, a gap in an area which is very hard to get into. And so the pilot would actually have to climb into the wheel bay to see if there's anyone there. So that's not really feasible. What we're talking about is probably putting CCTV cameras in there. Already when you fly, you'll get a camera on the tail and a camera looking at the ground. There's, a, there's talk now about putting cameras into the wheel wells so that the pilot, part of the checks on pilots is that they can actually see what's in there. And it's not just people stowing away. They've had animals and we've had situations where birds have caused trouble in these wheel wells. So there's a move now by the manufacturers to actually insert cameras into these wheel wells, which will, of course, be a major move. Because if it's been tampered with by someone um, hiding there, then the pilot knows that there's a problem and then there'll be a secondary check. 
um, or uh, the first case, they will just be able to see whether or not someone's in there. So that's that's the first. But it's it's not as big a problem as, for example, on ships, which have a much bigger problem with these things, and of course um, railways. Uh, so airlines have not really experienced the major difficulty with this. It's a terrible incident because you just imagine the body falling from the sky. And in the case you'd mentioned in Clapham, the body fell a, about a meter away from someone who was sunbathing. So that's, I mean, horrific. And we, our imagination runs wild. But it's actually over 50, 60 to almost uh, 80 years of flying to have 120 examples, official examples, is not a crisis. Mm, indeed. Well, thank you so much for that insight. Desmond Latham joining us there from Johannesburg. And here in our studio with us is Mwenda Mbijiwe. Thanks very much to both of my guests. Now turning our attention to some other news, a five-day anti-government protest has failed to take off in Zimbabwe as citizens ignored the call to stay away from work. Protest group Tajomoka Sezichikile had tried to mobilize Zimbabweans to shut down the country by engaging in a peaceful protest against a deteriorating economy. Today is meant to be day two of the shutdown, but it clearly hasn't materialized as people have gone about their business as normal. Organizers who called for the protest were hoping to capitalize on mounting frustration over rising prices, shortages of fuel and electricity, and a recent decision to ban the use of foreign currencies. President Emerson Mnangagwa says the reintroduction of the Zimbabwe dollar is necessary for long-term economic recovery. His government has warned civic society groups and labor unions against inciting mass action, which it says results in looting and destruction of property, as was witnessed during protests over a fuel price increase in January when security forces were called in to call the violence. Manangagwa has asked Zimbabweans to be patient as he implements reforms to repair the damaged economy. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, time now for a short break. Your business news up next. Coming up, a sigh of relief in Zimbabwe as the central bank extends forex withdrawal limits to $1,000 a day. And Chinese Premier Li Keqiang pledges more space for foreign investment in China. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Zimbabwe's government is allowing its citizens to withdraw up to $1,000 a day from foreign currency accounts without restrictions. Concerns have been looming that the central bank could raid foreign currency accounts as they did before in 2008. Now, according to the Reserve Bank, people and companies hold about $1.3 billion in foreign currency accounts. Zimbabwe is currently gripped by hyperinflation, fuel shortages and electricity cuts that last up to 15 hours. Recently, the government renamed its currency and made it the country's sole legal tender, ending a decade of dollarization. It's set to relaunch the currency as a fully-fledged um, currency soon. East and Central Africa's largest telecoms firm, Safaricom, has appointed Michael Joseph as interim CEO following the demise of Bob Collymore on July 1st. The former Safaricom CEO is expected to assume the position with immediate effect until the firm's board picks a permanent replacement. Joseph, who is the current chairman of the board of Kenya Airways, is also a member of Safaricom's board and was the CEO before being replaced by Collymore in 2010. The firm's growth has been exponential from a mobile operator to a market leader in Kenya. We turn to northeast China now, where the World Economic Forum's Summer Davos is being held in the coastal city of Dalian. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang gave a keynote address at the opening ceremony this morning. He declared China's firm support for multilateralism and said China will open up to more foreign investment. CGTN's Chu Hao reports. 
Chinese Premier Li Keqiang shared his views managing world economic growth amid uncertainty. Addressing the opening ceremony, Premier Li said though globalization faces issues such as inequality and lack of inclusion, blaming all problems on globalization itself is not the right path. We need to follow the trend of globalization and promote free trade and trade investment, liberalization and facilitation. We need to promote equal rights, equal opportunities and fair rules and improve institutional arrangements on that basis. Premier Li said China experienced many hardships and made many sacrifices over the last 40 years of reform and opening up. But the country is going to continue the policy opening up sectors like manufacturing and finance to foreign investment. Restrictions on foreign investment in value-added telecommunications services will also be reduced in 2020. Foreign-funded institutions will receive national treatment in credit investigations, credit ratings and payments, and the two-way opening of the bond market will be expanded. China will not go for competitive devaluation of its currency. Many attending guests said they welcome China's strong support for multilateralism and cooperation. I think uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, sectors which are applicable. In particular, uh, from, German, from the German perspective, I think we can uh, have good opportunities in many industry sectors, but also by uh, of selling of uh, uh, consumer goods. As foreign companies in China, we're very pleased to hear Premier Li Keqiang's comment on how Chinese government is creating an equal uh, and a fair uh, business opportunities, not only for state-owned enterprises, local Chinese businesses, but also foreign invested businesses in China. This is the 13th edition of the Summer Davos. As today's world struggles with a slowing economy, geopolitical tensions, and conflicting ideologies, this year's forum sends a strong message that China is committed to globalization and partnerships, which will help the world become a better place and have more people enjoy the technological benefits. Su Hao, CGTN. Dalian, Liaoning province. Well, Chi Hu Hao now joins us live from the forum in Dalian with more on the conversations going on there. Uh, Chi, to begin with, we know that, of course, Premier Li talked about globalization and China's economy, as well as announcing some measures to further open up the country. But what will those measures mean for foreign investors? Indeed, a lot of good news in, uh, for foreign business if they listen closely uh, to Premier Li Keqiang's speech this morning. For instance, he says China will strap foreign ownership limits in securities, futures and life insurance sector in 2020, which is a year earlier than it was originally scheduled. And this fast track means China is determined to create a sound and attractive financial sector as long as it is serving the real economy. And just this past weekend, China unveiled a new negative list, which is shorter and cuts limits to foreign investment from 48 down to 40. And seven sectors saw the ownership restrictions either relaxed or removed, including shipping agencies, gas and heat pipelines. And Premier Li also says China will strengthen protection of intellectual property rights, which has been a concern for many foreign enterprises. And he is not just to talk in the talk, but also walking the talk. China has uh, prohibited the forced transfer of technology with its foreign investment law, which would take effect the next year. So overall, his speech reassures the world that China is committed to opening up and is doing its utmost to provide an equal footing and business, good business environment for foreign investment. Back to you. Well, certainly a good start to summer Davos. Thank you so much, Chui Hui Hao, joining us there from Dalian. Now let's turn to news from South Africa. Nine state-owned entities posted total losses of $1.5 billion to March 2018. That's the most recent audit, uh, audit uh, able figures. Now ESCOM, SAA, SA Express, among others, all operated in the red. According to the National Treasury, loss-making public entities raked up a consolidated loss of over $3.2 billion. Angela Coppola has more. The remaining 17 smaller government businesses did reasonably well, but the quantum of their positive results couldn't reduce the losses incurred by the Big Nine. President Cyril Ramaphosa is concerned and has put plans in place. He and his team have tackled ESCOM first. We have done much to address governance challenges at several other state-owned enterprises and have been decisive in tackling corruption and state capture. We are supporting companies like SAA and Dinell as they seek to manage their dire financial positions 
and work to implement sustainable turnaround strategies. The SOE leadership need help and support if they are to fulfill their fiscal and developmental obligations and emulate what their peers are doing in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, in China specifically, where we've seen state-owned companies being extremely successful in terms of driving the developmental objectives of the state and really contributing to the fiscus, contributing to employment, contributing to job creation, contributing to the growth of the economy. As we address challenges of specific SOEs, we're also working towards a new SOE landscape in which state-owned companies have the expertise, they have the leadership, and appropriate financial models to fulfill their respective mandates. State-owned companies have a critical role to play in tandem with the private sector in driving economic growth as well as transformation. One approach is for private sector business leaders to step up and get involved in running those SOEs. It's been attempted successfully in the case of the post office and less so with SAA. Not many people want to pick up their hand to go and lead state-owned companies or play an executive role. Why? Uh, and it's largely because it's not an easy environment to be able to build strategy. It's not an easy environment to be able to maneuver. And we've now got the added complexity of liquidity challenges, financial challenges. Mark Barnes, the post office CEO, put up his hand nearly two years ago. He is making a difference. Last year, the post office took over the payment of social grants. Before taking on this responsibility in April 2018, only 31,000 social grants beneficiaries were paid through the post office. Last month, 7.8 million beneficiaries were paid through the post office, representing just over 70% of beneficiaries. South Africa's state-owned entities are in a perilous state at the moment, and if something isn't done soon, the sovereign rating of the country is in jeopardy. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Agriculture is one of the main drivers of Kenya's economy, and the government has pegged food security as one of the four key sectors that will spur economic growth. But in a country where smallholder farmers are driving the sector, one farmer has come up with innovative ways to grow his agribusiness and widen profit margins using technology. CGTN's Penina Karibe reports. Caleb Karuga meticulously tends to his cheeks. He is a known journalist who quit his job in local television station for agribusiness. His love for farming began during his early years while growing up in a farm in rural Kenya. But he says his venture into poultry farming was initially not on his plans. I wanted to know the source of my food. So I didn't start poultry farming as a business per se, just for me to feed myself and my friends, my colleagues. But then demand crept in. Uh, take to my colleagues and like, wow, we love the taste of those eggs. Where did you get them from? We love your chicken. Can you bring us more? So the orders were piling up. So somehow it morphed into a serious business. That was in 2010. With very limited knowledge of how to handle poultry, he lost many chickens, sometimes up to 20 in a single week. It took him four years to stabilize, years spent visiting other professional poultry farms and scouring the internet for every piece of information that could help improve his business. With time, Caleb discovered the magic of value addition. I realized that I was selling a seed. So if I sell an egg at, say, uh, Kenya shillings, say, 10 shillings, if I waited for 21 days, I could sell a chick at a dollar. And that makes a lot of sense. So where would I rather be, sell an egg at a quarter or just a dollar? I'd rather go selling chicks. And that's how now my business is anchored on selling the old indigenous chicken. The hatching farm is located several kilometers away from the brooding farm. He explains the distance helps in reducing transmission of diseases from the chickens to the eggs. In this farm, it's all about technology. There's a 12,000 capacity incubator working around the clock. Our machine is quite, quite good. We don't have to have much interruption because the machine is automatic. We have the machine set in such a way that whenever there is a variation in temperature, humidity, or maybe current flow, we have, uh, we have installed a trigger that is a siren that is going to tell us of when a problem has developed. From here, the delicate day-old chicks are shipped straight to the clients. 
But for those not confident enough to take care of the fragile chicks, Caleb rears them for an extra $1 per chick until they're a month old. This is a brooding room. There are currently 500 chicks in here, just a week old. But this is one of the most sensitive stages of poultry breeding. This room can hold up to a maximum 700 chicks up until they get to a month old. And during this time, a number of factors have to be considered. One of them is temperature. It has to be regulated from 37 degrees Celsius when they're just a week old and gradually lower to 20 degrees Celsius by the time they get to a month old. There's also the issue of diseases and to guard against that, they have to be vaccinated on a weekly basis. Caleb takes pride in the quality of his chickens. The organic vegetables come directly from his farm and he supplements that diet with a black soldier fly pupa. He's taken advantage of social media to connect with clients from as far as the UK, some in need of training to set up a thriving agribusiness centered on poultry. But Caleb also knows there is room for growth in this business with a little more help from technology. Well, if it's possible for us to have even cameras that are remotely uh, having censoring the temperature and the humidity, I don't have to come here every day. Robotics, everything is able to check, even the hygiene. A clear example of just how much technology can impact on agriculture. Penina Karibe, CGTN, in Nairobi, Kenya. Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. The raging debate over the costly bride price in Uganda. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Traditionalists in Uganda are concerned about the cost of the bride price. They argue that the marriage settlement is gradually becoming prohibitive, especially for young couples who find themselves choking on debt after matrimony. CGTN's Hilary Ayesiga finds out what it takes to marry a Ugandan woman. A marriage initiation spiced up with a local tradition rhythm and the custom demand, bride price has to be paid before taking your wife. It depends on what you need from the bottom of heart. You may decide a cow, one. Somebody may tell you, I need a Bible or a Quran, according to his wish. That's how it was in Uganda. But not had of cow, cattles, as it is in the West or in the North. In Uganda, the common price is cattle, goats, chicken, and sometimes money depending on the culture of the bride. Critics say bride price has become lavish and unreasonable. Some people exaggerate the token when they pay a visit to the girl's parents. They are driving a Benz or a Hummer. Some even hire helicopters. And the parents begin to dream big in terms of what should be paid as dowry. According to Uganda's Women Parliamentary Association, about 60% of couples in Uganda are cohabiting. They argue that marriage has been commercialized. A modest traditional marriage ceremony in Uganda now costs between $2,000 and $50,000. The problem is young people have combined cultures of different nationalities. That's why the ceremonies are expensive. My advice is that they should separate the cultures according to the norms. Giveaway ceremonies in Uganda are a sign of respect for many families, but custodians of this age-old tradition say if they are to keep it relevant to all generations, norms like bride price should be guarded against opportunists. Hilary Esga, CGT, Kampala. Education and cultural exchange programs between Zimbabwe and China have proved to be key in advancing and strengthening cooperation efforts. 
The two countries strive to have an understanding of each other's strengths and limitations in order to better work together. CGT CGTN's Chao Mgono has the details. Over the years, the relations between China and Zimbabwe have strengthened in various sectors, including trade, investment, mining, and tourism. Cooperation has also been solidified through culture and education exchange programs. The Confucius Institute of University of Zimbabwe has not only made positive contributions to enhancing mutual understanding, the mutual beneficial cooperation and the friendly exchange between our countries is showing much more potential in the field of trade, investment, tourism, culture, and education. And this will provide the students who learn Chinese and master the linguistic and professional skill with more career opportunities. Some students and teachers from Zimbabwe have had the opportunity to visit China to improve their Chinese proficiency and language. This 11th delegation will pursue various causes related to the Chinese culture. These trips are not only educational but also crucial in strengthening uh, the existing Sino-Zimbabwe relations. This collaboration with Hanban and Renmin University therefore puts us in good stead to advance the internationalization program in pursuit of our grand objective to become more relevant to national and global socio-economic challenges. The Chinese Embassy, in conjunction with the Renim University, has partnered with the University of Zimbabwe since 2007. They provide training for local students as well as teachers. More platforms are being built for the promotion of Chinese language and culture. 500 institutions and 600 classrooms have been established globally with a total of over 1 million students. Chom Hono, CGTN.